Welcome to Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with artists, authors, and activists during this ongoing COVID pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, Zoom casting, live streaming with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts, on the south side of Boston, here in our third year of the Shelter and Solidarity Project, shelterandsolidarity.org. Today, we are doing a follow-up show, our second show on the crisis in Ukraine which we did attend to a couple of months ago. And we're back with show number two under the framework of solidarity without militarism, views from Ukraine, Europe, and North America. We are very lucky here to have with us again today, uh, two returning guests. First, Olina Lubchenko from the Left East Project, as well as Jonathan Feldman of Global Teach-In. They will be joined by outspoken anti-imperialist US labor leader, David Van Doysen, who is the president of the Vermont AFL-CIO. They'll be introducing themselves a little more in a moment. Together today, we ask, is it possible to build solidarity without relying on militarism and therewith the fueling of further inter-imperialist conflict around this struggle in Ukraine and beyond? As this period of escalated conflict and Russian invasion enters its fourth month, what is the current state of things on the ground for the people of Ukraine and in the region? How has this event already altered global and domestic politics, including in Russia and in Europe, as well as in the United States, Canada, and beyond? How so are existing social movements and left political parties relating to recent developments? What are the dangers and opportunities of this moment for those struggling for a world of peace, justice, equality, and security? What can it mean to struggle for justice and solidarity with the people in Ukraine and elsewhere while rejecting the dominant paradigm of militarist response. A tall task, which I will be asking our speakers to, re to uh, reply to in a moment. But before we, we get into it, I just like to have them uh, kind of locate themselves a little bit more for those who aren't familiar with the, the three great speakers we are. Um, Alina Lubchenko, could you please uh, introduce yourself? And then we'll, we'll go Alina, then to Jonathan, and then to David. And then I'll say a few more words before I ask you to really dive into this crisis. But Alina, thank you for coming back to Shelter and Solidarity. Could you tell us a little bit about you and, and where you're at right now? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me again. I don't like introducing myself, but <laughs> I guess I have to. So I'm an editor at Left East. Um, it's an English language publication on Eastern Europe, but we're also expanding the global East and the Left East. Um, so uh, I'm also an editor at Midnight Sun. Um, it's a Canada-based kind of revolutionary socialist anti-racist feminist magazine. And I'm in Toronto right now. Um, I research the transformation of the gender contract and social citizenship model from the Soviet to the post-Soviet era in Russia and Ukraine. And I mostly uh, use kind of social reproduction feminism, social reproduction theory um, as my lens. Great, Alina. It's so great to have you back. Jonathan. Hi, I'm Jonathan Feldman. I'm at Stockholm University where I teach international relations. Um, I've been writing a lot of things lately about the Ukraine crisis for this blog, uh, um, globalteaching.com, and I contribute to Portside and Counterpunch as well. Um, part of my motivation has been the developments as we see them in Sweden, where the left party and the green party have supported the weapon shipments, although they're against NATO. The Social Democrats have shifted from being against NATO to submitting the application with the collaboration of other parties. Um, I've been studying militarism and anti-militarism for several decades and worked closely with Seymour Melman and uh, have a bunch of colleagues who are working on uh, that kind of framework. And um, there's so much to say, I better leave it at that. There you go. That's great, Jonathan. We will de definitely dive in more in a moment. And last but not least, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Joe. My name is David Van Dusen. I'm president of the Vermont AFL-CIO. The Vermont AFL-CIO, uh, I would say, is the most progressive state labor council in the United States, headed by the United Slate. Uh, we swept elections in 2019, 2020, and 2021, and are looking to build a more robust militant labor movement, which opposes imperialism and embraces social justice unionism. Uh, so again, uh, happy to be here with you all and look forward to this conversation. 
Terrific. And I think we have just a, a great lineup here. And as always on Shelter and Solidarity, around the hour mark or so, we will open up this conversation to the broader live audience. So uh, those of you who have questions, feel free to indicate that in the chat box, maybe even with a little caps, um, if you want to make sure our, our moderators, our, our editors, uh, and, and myself see the um, not, not our moderators, not uh, not editors. So we won't be editing you. We'll just be relaying your questions to our live audience around the hour mark. So until then, please do keep yourself muted so we can have as, as seamless a conversation as possible. Okay, so I've asked all of our guests to come today with, let's say, five minutes or so of a kind of opening comment about the way they see the situation today from their particular vantage point. We're not asking any of them to magically you know, blow away the fog of war and give us a reports from the front of what's going on in Ukraine, though obviously recent events related to the war will emerge um, as, as will other political developments into the picture. Um, but we want to just kind of, I mean, obviously this war in Ukraine, the escalation of the existing war, the Russian invasion and, and US NATO responses, uh, the Ukrainian resistance has, has really shifted global politics and, and political economy in many respects. So we're asking each of our speakers from their different vantage points, from Canada with a Ukrainian Russian uh, expertise, from the United States labor movement to the European left in Sweden, to kind of talk a little bit about how this event has has appeared where you are, how is it, it's been changing the terrain on which you work, what are the particular dangers or opportunities or things that are not seen as readily even in the, the so-called left that you want to lift up about the situation we face. Uh, before we get there, I'll just add a few, a couple of few very basic, which should be obvious points, but just to kind of mark this conversation. Uh, we are now in the fourth month since this escalation of a civil war into a full-out invasion of Russia in, in, in Ukraine. Um, we are dealing with all kinds of reports, sometimes conflicting, sometimes confirmed, dealing with thousands of civilian casualties, tens of thousands of troops killed, millions having fled Ukraine, um, concentrated fighting going on in the Donbass region as, as we speak. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, the passage of a $40 billion mili predominantly military aid package by the US government to, su to support Ukraine. Uh, this actually, to my knowledge, brings the total US pledge support of mostly military aid up to 53 billion dollars within just the first few months of this escalated conflict, uh, a rate of support which, to my knowledge, exceeds the, the rate of financial support that went into or, you know, of spending that went into the U.S. occupation and invasion of Afghanistan, for instance. So we're, we're talking about a, a large military aid package, 40 billion on top of another 12 or 13 billion that had already been given in other forms. And this is a largely bipartisan right, uh, political uh, consensus behind the passage of such, of, of, of this bill in the House. I don't think a single Democrat voted against it. The only resistance to this bill came from the right, ironically enough, a few, several Republicans voting against it. So, so I would like to get our, our uh, guest thoughts on this aid package, but I don't want to confine you to that. Uh, I would like, to, how has this war been playing out where you live, where you work? How has it been changing the politics where you are? And what do you think about the predominant response we're seeing from the U.S. government in terms of the militarist response to this Russian invasion of Ukraine? Uh, we'll start with Alina. Okay, um, so I want to say that um, I have uh, probably more questions than answers myself, but I'll open with a few um, maybe not so well formulated thoughts on two things, on the revival of uh, free world and on false clarity. So I think that um, recently, in, especially in the last maybe month, um, notions such as uh, the free world and the West and the empire of evil have been kind of retrieved. <laughs> and um, the cold, cold war is kind of the new intellectual compass uh, that somehow will help us navigate a world that is, you know, once again, pitting uh, democracies against totalitarianism, right? Um, so I think there has seems to be a revival of this Cold War liberalism um, and, um, you know, in, in some ways, kind of the, the, the righteous militarism, um, the necessary righteous militarism um, from the West and, you know, that so many of Western 
Cold War colonial uh, ventures themselves were only defensive to neutral to neutralize, say, the, the, the Soviet Union at the time, right? I think that um, the, the lack of understanding of the current situation makes the clarity of the Cold War so appealing today. Um, and, you know, but as the, as the salvage statement um, has highlighted, and I'll put it in the chat later, um, I think I, I find it more compelling to, to think about the conjuncture, um, which, which refuses kind of monocausal histories, right, or mo of modes of production, basically, or, or um, refuses to, to understand something um, in, in, in dichotomous ways, right? So I think I think one big question here then is 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 imperialism and and also around the cause of the war, right? Um, I believe we we are not able to answer this question um, as internationalists in good faith right now. So for me, I, I think I find the idea that this is a defensive war only, or you know, first and foremost, a defensive war. Uh, for Russia, I think against um, NATO expansion, I find that dubious in terms of the you know direct cause. Um, but um, there's but but how how do we bring together opposing further NATO expansion uh, while at the same time holding uh, you know the thought that previous NATO expansion um, didn't necessarily cause directly this particular war, this Russia's decision on direct military action in Ukraine, right? If say outside of the Donbas region, so I think the most difficult and necessary task um, is to oppose further NATO expansion and Western military buildup, um, uh, while also rejecting kind of Russia's dubious. NATO narrative cause around this war. Um, and I think that this is kind of, yeah, as I said, the most difficult and necessary task. Um, and I think Europe does not need to spend more money on weapons to counter Russia, right? Um, but but being, in, being in Toronto, um, you know, working and living here, I cannot, help but think about how the boosting of the military industrial profits and expenditures on the kind of on this Ukraine war right will translate into greater militarization globally and the further bolstering of, of uh, US NATO alliances and the repression right um, you know uh, it, this this militarization by using the imagery of Ukrainian devastation, um, of course, what will happen is that these weapons will be used against other working class people, right? Uh, both in Canada, in the United States. Um, so the 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 what aboutism here, uh, the reality of these double standards, is not a reason, of course, for for wanting to Ukraine to suffer the same fate as as the others, right? But we should not encourage the military and industrial con uh, you know, complex, uh, the growth of it uh, that we know will continue to crush other groups uh, that are seeking self-determination, right? Um, so what, what happens to, to Yemenis, what happens to indigenous communities here in Canada, um, we see what militarization um, is doing in the United States. Um, so when we think, we take ourselves seriously thinking um, about defunding the police or abolishing the police, right? Especially in this current moment, uh, the devastation that happened in Texas in the US. Um, when we think about these, these um, kind of uh, left demands, right? Um, and alternatives, well, how, how, how do they work together with further militarization in Ukraine and uh, self-determination and defense there against aggression? For me, this is a very big question that is um, that I cannot resolve for myself yet. Yeah, thank you, Alina. Right, you, you mentioned the, the mass shooting in Texas. We could also mention the mass shooting in Buffalo. Right, we have this kind of universal, well, perhaps not universal, but widespread just decrying of this massive gun violence at the same time as a bipartisan support for a $40 billion arms package to, to send more arms to Ukraine and, and God knows where else. 
right? I, I really appreciate you lifting lifting up that problem without an easy answer. Jonathan, how do things appear to you? You, you speak to us from Sweden, a country that has been a, applying now for NATO membership in, in response, at least in part, to this current conjuncture and this crisis. How do things look on the ground to you in Sweden, Jonathan? Um, well, bad. <laughs> um, well, let me give you an example of the latest thing I've learned. So there's an editor, of, there's two principal left publications and the editor publisher of one of them recently recirculated this uh, letter critiquing Noam Chomsky and wondered if he could be published in his publication, if I understood this tweet correctly. And there was a leading uh, left journalist who's written books about anti-capitalism in Britain. And he also said, you know, Chomsky's getting his due or some such thing. So, I mean, part of the problem in all these lefts is there's confusion within the left. Um, I am not a right winger, at least I don't think so. Um, while I'm not posing as a Putinist, some people believe. But I mean, I mean, the uh, thing is I'm against Putin's brutal war. I'm against Russian militarism. I traveled a long time ago to the Soviet Union at the tail end there, trying to get them to convert with some of my colleagues, you know, trying to get them to demilitarize. I think part of the problem is the left has some baggage or paradigm in how it frames things that confuses it. That's part of the problem here. So there are these tropes about victims. And the left has tried to ride this victimization ideology very, very long. And now it's catching up to them because the Status quo is using that against the left and basically co-opting it. We have a perfect storm here, so to speak, to use the American discourse. A democracy branded or, or something branded as a democracy is Ukraine. I don't want to debate the level of democracy. This let's take for granted it is some kind of democracy. Russia is directly involved as opposed to these proxy conflicts, although this is partially a proxy war with the US. Um, a country that is very close to Russia's strategic interests, and I do not buy the idea that these interests do not exist, because if uh, Mexico wanted to join a military alliance uh, with Russia, that country would face some kind of intervention without question. And then we have a Democratic president who, I must admit, I did vote for. Um, so there's some kind of aura there among those sympathetic to that branch of the political duopoly. So. Because of this, and because of this victimization kind of thing, and we have uh, this perfect storm that I outlined, the, the left has been confused and uh, compromised. The other problem here is there's been a whole long discussion about militarism and anti-militarism. And this cannot be, my view is a bit different from some other people on the left. I don't think it's just an ism that has to be subsumed under Marxism or gender or race or other kinds of things. It is its own ism that interacts with these as a special kind of system. And the, the logic of demilitarization and disarmament, which appears in peace movement pacifists, but also left anti-militarists, is not well known to everybody in the left. And as a result, there's some confusion here. Now, I wanna deal um, and so the left party has gone for armed shipments in the end. Uh, they All parties have gone for increasing the military budget. They seem to un misunderstand how you defuse a crisis. Sweden and Finland had a special role to uh, de-engage from this, disengage from the system. So even if you could argue for the weapon shipments, there could be a good cop diplomacy uh, thing that was boarded by this political trajectory. Um, the last thing I want to say is um, this, I wanna take on the question of the discussion head on. What is militarism and what is solidarity? How might they overlap and where don't they overlap? So I wanna say this very briefly because I hope this is part of our discussion. So where militarism does not overlap with solidarity is when you transfer weapons to a country without having any concern for diplomacy and diffusing a very dangerous situation. That is very clear where diplomacy, sorry, where militarism does not overlap with solidarity in the slightest. Now, how do you have solidarity without militarism? Well, you do have self-defense and I'm not a pacifist. So like, for example, during World War II, you know, it was right to have the US do all this military stuff and, you know, get rid of the fascists, although the Soviets did help with that, of course. So. Another way is you provide foreign aid, you help refugees, and you have good faith 
diplomacy. So that is solidarity without militarism. The problem is we have a lot of the overlap of these two circles, the circle of militarism and the circle of solidarity. And how does that happen? Well, it happens because you, you're in solidarity with the, uh, a, a people that is under vicious attack, but then you don't do the diplomacy bit. So I paid some attention to somebody who had one of these YouTube videos and he's going on and on about like, well, isn't it obvious that we should send weapons and this and that? And yeah, you should perhaps or perhaps not send weapons. I'm a bit on the, the agnostic side of that equation, particularly sitting in Sweden that used to be disengaged from these things. But anyway, you know, as uh, if, if Russia's calculations depend partially on what the US does, if you accept that, then it's kind of disingenuous to send the weapons and have the sanctions, but have no expectation of diplomacy. So that's where things get very confused in terms of the solid, you know, yeah, it's not wrong to send any weapons because otherwise they'd be plowed over. And I've heard this arguments over and over again, but what happens when you send the weapons, but you don't really have any intention to negotiate? Well, that could be solidar solidarity with militarism. And in that case, solidarity um, is not necessarily a pure and unadulterated concept. I don't believe that solidarity is always good because we could be sol solidaristic with bad processes and bad people. Now I'm not saying the Ukrainians are bad. I have my own, you know, Ukrainian background, if that's important. But I am saying there's a way in which it's being manipulated, reinterpreted, so that people on the left are ending up aligning with the US military industrial complex and warfare state, even if Russia is a brutal militaristic power, much like it's a mirror in the United States, by the way. Thank you so Sorry, much. Sorry, that was a mouthful, but I- It is, but I, and, and despite, uh, despite that you, you did give us a lot there. I did want to ask you if you could briefly give us a, you know, a few sentences of clarity about what you mentioned. Uh, you talked about victimization ideology on the left as part of the, the kind of left's confusing baggage that has that the uh, ruling powers have, have begun to co-opt or and use and is biting us in the ass. Could you just say a little more about, I think I have a sense of what yes. you mean, but for those who might yes. not be okay. up on that. Could you, could you clarify that? Thank you. Yes, I mean, so yeah. So Saul Bellow wrote a novel called The Victim and Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism talked about while the Jews were victims of, of the Holocaust, there was an element in which they played a somewhat ambiguous role, not that they deserve to be victimized. I mean, that would be an absurd conclusion, but there's a way in which there are entanglements in which one side does something the other side views as provocative. And while the side that's being provoked is not necessarily justified in the response, it would be bad faith to deny how they are provoked or how the side that's doing something to the other side um, is has, I don't wanna use the word responsibility because uh, of course Russia has the ultimate responsibility for what it does, but uh, I do think that they have, I think it's fair to say that they have been provoked. So while Ukraine is a victim, uh, it started cooperating with NATO even before uh, 2014, as I got information from the NATO website, this isn't from a left-wing website. So that's part of it. I mean, another part, another thing is this issue of rights. Ukraine has the right to do this. They have the right to do that. They have the sovereignty to do this and the sovereignty to do that. Here's a perfect example of how the left uses language, which confuses it when it comes to diplomacy, disarmament, and demilitarization. Because if you're going to demilitarize, you have to give up some of your sovereignty. Now, you see, if you just view rights and sovereignty as ends in themselves, and if you turn concessions, which you need in diplomacy to demilitarize into something called capitulation, and you manipulate the meaning of, of words like that, you can stay within a certain kind of left brand of discourse and confuse yourself about how to actually demilitarize. And so you, so the, the long and the short of it is, you can't just think in terms of victims and build a narrative around that and deduce every single conclusion you have about one side as a victim. Because as I said, or as Simon Vail, Hannah Arendt, and Saul Bellow have shown, victims can be victimizers and it's not sufficient uh, to show that you're a victim. That's not the beginning, middle, and end of the story. And some people have made it like that, okay? I mean, there are a lot of people who, I mean, in the Ukraine narrative, 
there have been people who have been victims on various sides of the equation. Now, Russia is obviously the grand victimizer, and there's no point in denying like that, d- denying that. Some people in some exotic branches of the left think Zelensky is a fascist and um, all this sort of, I mean, this is a, absurd, but there's a lot of shades of gray here. And so you got to, I mean, you need something more to your intellectual toolkit than to identify a victim, look at the images that the media and the politicians and the experts have provided you with and build all your conclusions from that. I think you have to be a bit more critical. And so what I'm trying to say is the logic of demilitarization involves other concepts, other language, which is not widely distributed in the left. That's why parts of the left in Sweden, Britain, US, they've all been co-opted because they lack this language. Because part of the development of these political entities is that they've engaged in social amnesia about these concepts. They don't understand basic ideas and thoughts because that was not popular. It did not sweep sweep through the universities. One last thing, when I wrote a a book about universities and the business of oppression decades ago, a lot of people were more interested in Foucault than that their local university might be aiding the Pentagon because that was very fashionable and trendy. See, you could talk about resistance and oppression, all this sort of stuff. Meanwhile, your university is involved in dirty laundry, investing in, in defense firms and, and having research done that uh, drops napalm on people or some such thing. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. A lot to, to chew on there. And we will come back to some of these issues, I think. And, and that actually, but I do think you've given us a, with your mention of the gray areas of the, that often are excluded or gray zones that are excluded from these kind of very moralistic, righteous, binary views of this conflict, victim, victimizer, no complex causality, no complex history. I think that sets up David uh, Vendoysen, who, who came onto my radar when it was when a piece um, he had written, which is now up at Counterpunch, I'm not sure where it appeared originally, uh, appeared, I believe it, it, the title, the provocative title was, um, and I thought very uh, well-written article, um, no love for Putin, no guns for Nazis. So, uh, so David, uh, how does the situation feel, uh, look to you right now, several months into this conflict, um, and uh, both as an internationalist, as a, as, a, as a leader in the labor movement in Vermont, uh, what stands out to you you want to highlight? Look, as president of the Vermont AFL-CIO and as a member of Local 2413 of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, I am on the working class left, and I'm not confused at all. Vladimir Putin and Russia today is not the Soviet Union. They they are not aspiring to a socialist or communist society. Uh, They are concerned with notions of empire. We are right to generally condemn the Russian aggression in the Ukraine. And we are right to condemn this imperialist invasion. However, we also need to call a spade a spade, right? So here's the thing, Uh, the Ukraine has gone through uh, some serious issues since 2014 with a rise of fascism. Now, Putin overstates this. Putin uh, overplays the hand when he talks about Ukraine as a Nazi state. It is not. But it has serious, serious problems on the far right. When we talk about Mirapol and the steel plant, which uh, until recently was holding out in, in that city, that was being defended by the Azov Battalion. That organization is a Nazi organization. Its founder wants founder wants a crusade to cleanse Europe of immigrants, uh, and they're they're against uh, anybody who's not white, for that matter. These are Nazis. These are fascists. And what we see now is billions of dollars of American money, and 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 billions more from Europe, flooding weapons into the Ukraine without any conditions attached to them, without saying that these weapons cannot go to Nazis, they they cannot go to fascist uh, groupings and militias in the country. Uh, that, that, That is insane. That is absolutely insane. Now let's put this in context some, before the Russian invasion, the Azov was a incorporated part of the armed forces of the Ukraine. That means when they're a Nazi organization, that means that Ukraine is the only country in the world with record. Sorry, David, we uh, somehow you got muted there. You may have to uh, back up a, a sentence or two. I think we just lost the last sentence or two. Sorry about that. So with the Azov Battalion before the Russian invasion being an incorporated part of the Ukrainian armed forces, we have to recognize and we have to factor in that that means the Ukraine is the first nation in the world with openly fascist uh, aspects within its recognized armed forces 
since the fall of Franco in Spain. Now, look, we could have a discussion about the Ukrainians' right to defend themselves. They do have that right, and I do not begrudge that. And we could have a discussion about the appropriate use of Western resources uh, to help provide arms in some capacity. That could be a discussion. But to send arms, to send uh, weapons without conditions attached, without any guarantees that they're not going to be directly handed over to fascist uh, groups within the country is off the wall and dangerous. Now, let's not forget that when the Soviet Union invaded um, Afghanistan decades ago, the United States had no qualms about arming the Mujahideen. And where does that leave us after Russia leaves, right? That leaves us with Al Qaeda down the road. That leaves us with 9-11. So we need to, when we look at Ukraine today, we can't just look at the struggle that's going on this second. We can't just look at the politics that are going on this moment. We have to take a long view. And it is not right for the left or the unions or the working class people to uncritically support groups that, uh, that have an interest in, in making, making Ukraine white and making Ukraine um, fascist or, or right wing. So it, it is a complex situation. I understand that. But this is not... This shouldn't be, we shouldn't take Western propaganda at face value. This is not Machno riding out to meet uh, the whites or the nationalists or the Bolsheviks. This is not a progressive fight. This is not something where uh, there's, there's the good guy with the white hat versus just the bad guy with the black hat. So I think we need to take a critical look at what's going on here. And we can't lose sight of of the politics that was going on before the most recent Russian invasion. We have to also look at what's been going on since 2014. We have to look at the repression of Russian speakers within the Ukraine. We have to look at the Donbass region uh, who determined that they wanted to go a different way before the war. And we have to look at what's gonna come out of this one way or another. So those are my concerns. Uh, I know that there's plenty of places to have discussions about, but uh, we can't just take things at face value. Yeah, thank you, David. Some really important points. I mean, it, it has occurred to me since, you know, I've been studying this conflict really just in the last several months, trying to, to kind of get in a position to facilitate some of these discussions, that really the, the situation does look quite different if you start the story in 2014 or 2008, you know, rather than just in 2022, right? And, we, and, and of course, I would welcome, you know, our, our great panel of guests kind of digging into that, um, that, um, kind of uh, comment by David in terms of how we understand the broader context here. I mean, Alina, since you were the, the first speaker, I, I'd kind of welcome you to step into that. I mean, how does your um, own sense of the causality of this conflict kind of inform your, your current, uh, current view of what is, is, uh, is, is uh, transpiring? I mean, I know you, you've mentioned that you have more questions than answers on some of these things. But clearly, uh, you've been following things quite closely. You also um, have been working through Left East and uh, the other journal you work with. Uh, the name escapes me. The Midnight Midnight Sun. Midnight Sun. You've been in, involved with reaching out to anti-war activists on the left in Russia and bringing some of their voices out. So I wonder um, if you'd like to speak to this question of how we frame the causality of the war and, and its implications, but also uh, what's a key piece that often falls out of this binary Cold War narrative is what, what about dissenting voices within Russia uh, itself? So I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the dissenting voices within Russia itself would say that Russia is, if not becoming a fascist state, is definitely exhibiting certain fascistic tendencies today. Uh, so when we talk about Nazis in Ukraine, we also need to talk about that part as well. Um, I think that this, I find myself in this discussion right now, um, a little bit, maybe, I feel like this discussion is very US centric. And I think that a lot of um, Eastern European comrades, both in Ukraine and in Russia and elsewhere would say, we need to understand um, also uh, Russian imperialism. I think there's quite a, quite a lot of confusion around, around that. And um, it's Russia's interests in this war, in particular from, from the point of view of Russia and not you know, necessarily from the left in the US. Um, um, and um, I think that there's very little work still being done 
on this, but I'll drop in, in the chat a few pieces that might be interest, of interest to us to this discussion. Um, I just wanted to say something um, in terms of Jonathan's uh, comment about um, militarism and demilitarism. Um, I think it's absolutely an it does have to do with anti-racist and feminist politics because we know uh, who is who suffers from militarism, you know, and I've written about or militarization um, of, of the state and I've written about this also in terms of Ukraine. Uh, we know that uh, women bear the brunt of, of militarization when, when a lot of uh, funding is for the military industrial complex or from for the military is taken away from social programs and, and justified in, in such a way to cut to social spending and so on right. Um, and we know who has to deal with soldiers that come back from military um, engagements and, and from the war right um, and, and what it does to to society at large so. So those who, who are the victims in this conflict, I mean, and this, this idea of victimization ideology on the left, I'm not, I, I, I'm not so certain about this framing. I think that the victims of this conflict are working class people, you know, in Ukraine and in Russia as well. And, um, and, and we need to be, you know, mindful of, of trying to, as, as the left, we have to kind of, remove ourselves sometimes from this, so from the discussions at the level of the military industrial kind of conflicts of big states like warring against each other and think about, uh, you know, the political economy analysis of this, but also um, questions around social reproduction, right? Um, I, I, at least that, that would be my own kind of inclination. Um, in terms of, uh, Joe, what you've asked about um, the anti-war resistance in, in Russia, um, we just published the article um, in, in Midnight Sun. It's an interview with two Russian comrades who are you know, involved in this resistance. I think it's really good because I think it looks at the everyday struggles, the creativity of, of, of the movement. How do you resist in the situation where you might face 15 years or so in prison? You know, um, When you say, no, this is not a special operation, it's a war, it's Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, and um, and yeah, I, I think it's a great interview. We we spoke about um, how Russia actually has been supporting right wing movements and and right wing governments, both in the global north and the global south. We have to remember this as well. And it's on militarization right now, uh, where uh, where um, you know also funding is taken away from social services, from childcare. Mm -hmm from you know, the public sector and tr transferred into the military, into the police budgets as well. So there's a militarization of the Russian state and society at the same time. Absolutely. And I mean, that's, I mean, perhaps what can be so scary about these situations, a kind of mutual polarization, right? And, and, and a mutual empowerment of the right wings of all the countries involved in, in this conflict. Um, I mean, there's, um, it seems to be, I mean, it's never, it's always hard to tell what's going on in the heads of the leaders that are making these decisions. And, and to some degree, it's maybe a, you know, just a sinkhole to even try to get into that, what's going on in Putin's head. But it does seem to be plausible that uh, Putin or the Russian state may have miscalculated regarding the, the significant resistance that they would face, uh, at least in parts of Ukraine. Of course, again, the fog of war dimension is always difficult to subtract here. And there's a lot of uncertainty, at least uh, for me, um, but about what's actually happening on the ground versus what the story is we often get through our mainstream media. Um, but it does seem that uh, the, the striking amount of Ukrainian resistance um, has not only uh, shifted the, the Russian military tactics and approach to the war, but also maybe shifting the U.S. war aims as well. I mean, we actually, Jonathan, something you've written about, and, I, and I'd like to direct maybe this next question to you. Um, it seems like even the New York, New York Times and some mainstream outlets in the United States that have been very much behind the support Ukraine and support the aid package are raising questions about the degree to which U.S. policymakers 
uh, war aims are, are, are shifting or are coming out of the closet as not just about supporting Ukraine or limiting the damage to Ukraine or, or stopping Russian aggression, but actually trying to turn this war into more and more of a proxy war uh, that might be aimed at destabilizing, weakening the Russian state, toppling the Putin regime, et cetera. I'm kind of curious what your read is on that. Um, and, and to some degree, this, this, this builds on the, the, the concern about broader concerns for the pre-existing agendas of militarist forces within the United States and beyond uh, that may be inspired by the Ukrainian resistance thinking, oh, we can, we can turn this war into something altogether different. I also want to cite one statistic before I, I, I pass it to you, and that is my understanding, this $50 billion plus that the U.S. has now allotted for mostly military aid to Ukraine is by uh, the source I just looked at, and granted it was a Glenn Greenwald piece I, I heard the other day, but but apparently that $54 billion is significantly, it's like more than two-thirds of the total annual Russian military budget of $69 billion. So I just think, I mean, the amount of aid that's, I, I do think some historical comparisons are, are, are significant. I mentioned it's more than per month than the U.S. spent in its own war in Afghanistan. Uh, I just, certainly the scope of this. I mean, what is, I don't know if you've had a chance to parse what some of this aid is, the kinds of weapons that are being passed on. I mean, in your inter, your, your uh, engagement with Chomsky, you point out that he admits like some arms shipments could be justified arming Ukrainians if it's at the right scale, if it's really in the service of self de defense and not escalation of the conflict, if it's not serving this other agenda. What's your read on this aid package and on the shifting, if you see it as a shift at all, the shifting kind of conjuncture within the US uh, kind of power elite or NATO um, uh, interest in terms of how they're reacting or taking advantage of this you know, tragic and, 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 and uh, devastating conflict. Okay, uh, yeah, before I answer that, I just wanna clarify something. I'm not saying that there is not a gender or race dimension to militarism or policing, which is turning into militarism. I'm simply suggesting that I don't think you can look through those lenses without having a lens of militarism or projection of violence and the logics attached to that. And uh, what I'm particularly interested in is the, the framing of the Ukraine as a uniform entity with sovereignty as a victim. All this kind of language is my primary concern. Anyway, to answer your question, um, no, I'm not sure there's as big a shift as people think. I think these, these episodes of humanitarian intervention start off with rather similar patterns, whether we're talking about Chomsky's book, The New Military Humanism, or Alan Cooperman's analysis of uh, Libya and other such conflicts, um, the war in Iraq, et cetera. They start off with a certain uh, discourse, but they have an underlying logic to them. So in this case, since I believe the negotiations that the United States offered with uh, involving Ukraine and Russia were bad faith from the beginning, they weren't really authentic. Um, they, they didn't really have an interest to solve the conflict. They had in it because the head, the Stoltenberg, the head of NATO, kept on going around saying, well, every nation has the right to join NATO and be part of NATO and everything. So, I mean, this thing has been entangled in a conflict between NATO and the US military bloc and Russia and its bloc with Ukraine, kind of uh, somewhat stuck in the middle, somewhat allied with one over the other. Um, and that has implications whether the, whether Ukraine, Ukraine does not deserve to be subject to these attacks, but they have implicated themselves in a geopolitical conflict. I mean, this is a reality. This is not what is desirable. I think that's another problem with this whole thing. I mean, you try to explain how things work and then that's turned into some normative thing by some people. I mean, this is how things work. You have big blocks of power. They conflict with each other and you try to not to trigger. So, Let's get Russia. Russia has an indigenous military industrial complex that inherited from the Soviet Union with some modification and scaling down. So the idea is you don't want to trigger that. But the US seems to have gone out and NATO seem to have gone out of the way to trigger it. And as uh, Van den Heuvel from The Nation has said, NATO is sort of cleaning up the problems that it creates. That's, its, that's sort of its purpose. So um, I think what you're talking about, which is significant, is parts of the elites are having doubts 
because they're wondering, well, gee whiz, part of us backed this Biden to do this infrastructure, Green New Deal, kind of recycle some of what Trump brought up, but maybe perhaps in a more authentic way, this thing is sort of gonna maybe conflict with that. And there are Republicans who you pointed out are exploiting the opportunity cost of continuing this. Um, you know, it's not clear that uh, some people have gamed this out and they have said, well, we can't continue to spend $50 billion a year forever for this thing. And so at a certain level, we're going to pull out. And the odds are the U.S. will pull out. I mean, they pulled out in Afghanistan after 20 years. They pulled out of Vietnam. Eventually, the U.S. will pull out because guess why? Because there becomes a domestic political opportunity cost doing this thing however justified it may or may not be. That's a fact. And so that is one of the pressures for diplomacy uh, that those who use this victim narrative cannot really explain because they say that if you stop funding, you stop continuing the war, you, um, you're somehow a traitor to Ukraine being victimized as if the US has nothing to do with it. So I think it's parts of the elite maybe have thought ahead on the chessboard and realized that, well, sooner or later, this is not gonna be beneficial for us. And the right wing, what if the Republicans take over the Congress? Then what are you gonna do? What if Trump becomes the president? Then what are you gonna do? All these things are really not being answered as part of this kind of uh, advertising political package to promote the uh, conflict, at least in terms of as far as the US is involved. So I think that's part of what is going on. Maybe some people thinking ahead and having some regrets about, well, because if it weren't costly, they wouldn't do it. I mean, we, see, we saw this during the uh, Ukraine gate crisis or whatever it was called in the United States. People trying to make political, get, and this is something I think Greenwald has emphasized, people trying to make political capital domestically out of this thing. And after a while, when it no longer serves their purpose, they abandon ship. And so some people may realize, hey, if we don't, if we don't abandon the ship on our terms, this could blow up in our faces. I think that may be part of what the elite is thinking. I see. Uh, and, jo and Jonathan, a couple interesting questions have come in for you in the chat, which we'll come to after the hour mark, and we'll maybe dig a little more into the particular politics unfolding in Sweden, where you are located and, and, and very involved here. But you, you raise a, a broader question. I think you've raised it a couple times. I, I'd like to just kind of surface, and that is, you know, what is the relationship or what could be or ought to be the relationship between diplomacy and military support or, or, or military, military solidarity? In a, in a situation such as this. It seems like, as you've pointed out, the in your terms, the victimization narrative often uh, kind of forecloses any understanding of kind of complexity here, as if you have to just, to condemn the invasion, you have to just kind of participate in the Putin is just another incarnation of Hitler, and there's no appeasing such a person. There's no realpolitik that we should encounter. It's a, it's a moral crusade. And, and so the more military aid, the better. But it seems like, of course, some people like Aaron Maté at the Gray Zone have called this, you know, the paraphrase this policy is, we will fight to the last Ukrainian, right? A US policy of just arming Ukrainians to the point where, yes, the war maybe can raise more costs for the Russians, but, but not in a way that actually improves Ukrainian lives, but actually may not change the ultimate end, but just make it a more devastating process before you get to that inevitable diplomatic end anyway. Um, so, I mean, David, I, I, I would like to bring you in here and, and, and on that question. And of course, we can come back to Elena and Jonathan on this broader question of what would a diplomatic uh, solution look like? Uh, but I guess I, I really to kind of maybe take it a, a step deeper, I'd like to ask what can, what can and should we be doing as people in the labor movement? I mean, active in, 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 our, in our faculty union at UMass Boston as well. Um, you know, what do you think is the role for the left, what can what can we doing or be doing, or what are you doing to to help build the muscle, anti-war muscle inside and outside of labor movement and social justice movements, so that our ideas on the left, even if we do have a great analysis on what diplomacy should be, that we actually have the power to enforce that. I mean, because I mean, one of the things that's kind of tragic and even tragic comic about the left and the so-called left in the United States these days, you have all these groups debating the right line on Ukraine, but none of them developing anything like the capacity to make their 
analysis or their their prescription actually enforceable, right? We have people, you know, groups tearing each other apart over, you know, how to understand Russian imperialism, but not having a base, a grassroots base that could actually make a politician vote differently on any of these bills coming down, let alone introducing new legislation that could point in a different, different direction. So as someone in the labor movement who's nonetheless taken these kind of stances publicly, what's your analysis on how do we build, um, you know, anti-war, pro-peace, anti-fascist sentiment, anti-militarism within and around the labor movement so that our ideas actually matter here uh, in the belly of the beast. And they're, we're not just uh, engaged in leftist talk shops where we can tear each other to pieces over the wrong line. Well, if we're talking about a different issue, if we're talking about um, more domestic uh, issues, uh, I think uh, the question of how we build power and how we impact change uh, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, and that's not through uh, aligning ourselves with the Democratic Party or putting our eggs in the basket of lobbyists in D.C., but rather organizing and building power on the shop floor and in our communities. But uh, when it comes to the Ukraine, uh, we have a different starting point. If you look at both the liberal and conservative media, the, the propaganda, the uncritical discussion uh, is, is immense. Uh, we have to be able to first break through. The, the propaganda, the United Party line of both the Repu mainstream Republicans and Democrats to have a real discussion about what's actually going on in Ukraine, what is actually at stake, and what are the dangers of being involved. And I don't believe that we got there as a society yet. I mean, you put on um, Fox News or MSNBC, you're essentially going to be seeing the same message. So here, I do think that dialogue and discussion and cutting through the propaganda is the first step. But once we get there, uh, then we have to rapidly uh, build consensus around ending uh, support for uncritical military aid to the Ukraine. We need to have conditions attached. We need to make sure that the kind of future we're investing in is not one where fascists are, are now in control of a large country in, in Europe. And, and this is not to try to prop up uh, Putin or the Russians, they're wrong and they're right wing as well. Uh, but we still have to look at the realities here. Now, historically, if we look about labor's role in uh, anti-imperialist um, fights, uh, you, could look, you could look to the longshoremen when they've done workplace actions where refused to remove uh, goods that are, or ship or, or, or load goods that are going to war zones, which we as labor don't agree with. The Italians also are very active on those fronts. So we potentially have a massive amount of power to impact the war machine if we so choose. But we can't get to that point until we have a real discussion and debate and come to a consensus on where, on the realities of, of, of where we are now. If I might ask you, uh, David, what was the response to your piece like? I um, mean, again, as the, the sitting president of a statewide union, um, you, you took a, a fairly public stance against the, the dominant propaganda uh, we're getting from both, you know, major parties, most mainstream media outlets. Um, what was the response to that uh, positively, negatively within your union and without? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, it definitely stood out to me as an exceptional a union federation, I should say. It wasn't just a single union. Um, you know, what did you learn by putting that line out there in terms of your own members or the, the community's uh, response? Well, first of all, I didn't write that op-ed that you reference, um, you know, on a whim. Uh, leading up to that, I actively engaged and asked for feedback and asked for people's points of view from within our, our labor organizations here in Vermont about how they viewed things, right? So I'd like to, I, I'd like to have, I enjoyed that conversation as a starting point and also met with a, a progressive party a state legislator here in Montpelier, whose family is from the Ukraine, and talked with her at some length about her views about the conflict, right? So the op-ed was the culmination of a process of kind of gathering information and gathering points of view. By and large, uh, I think that uh, folks did not, um, uh, they did appreciate the honest analysis and discussion. I had fairly positive feedback. But the funny thing in the broader notion of the left, is you have a couple different camps, both of which I think are wrong on the left. You have folks, uh, some of which uh, used to be associated with groups like the ISO when that used to exist, 
who feel very strongly that the Ukraine is fighting a war of national liberation, which I totally, I disagree with. They, they were not an occupied country uh, before the Russian invasion. And so therefore uh, that part of the left will throw uncritical support to arming the Ukrainians and, and uh, supporting the Ukrainian resistance. And then on the other side of it, there's some other Trotskyist groups who I've had some discussion with who take the absurd point of view that Russia is incapable of being acting in an imperialist way because their economy isn't large enough. And so therefore somehow Russia is unequivocally right in everything it does. I think both those points of view are, are frankly absurd, right? I think that reality is, is something very different from both of those polarizations. What I see the left doing largely is trying to take, I mean, the broader left, I'm not talking about the union left, the working class left, but what I see people doing is trying to take a preordained ideology, pre like uh, an equation that they come to the table with and trying to force the Ukrainian conflict into that ideology like a round peg into a square hole. And I don't think that serves us well. I think that uh, it, the ideological approach is gonna be doomed to failure because it's not based on the reality and the facts on the ground and the history from 2014 forward that gets us to this point. Yeah, really well said, David. Thank you very much. Uh, we are approaching the hour mark, but I wanna give Olina, uh, at least Alina and possibly Jonathan again, a chance to build on this, maybe by flagging. I, I kind of liked uh, David's last point, talking about views on the left that are kind of an obstacle to even getting the point to the point of having a meaningful conversation here. And I think you flagged two really important, as you say, absurd, but nonetheless influential views. And of course, not to just focus on the left, but also of course, problems with the mainstream narrative and the propaganda that keep us from ever getting to the clarity that then could build, we could build a real working class consensus around. Um, Alina, what would you say are problems that you see either in mainstream narratives? I know you're up in Canada, but I'm sure you, you, you can't avoid some of the US uh, driven discourse, um, but, but also perhaps um, in, in other left scenes you're, you're, uh, you're familiar with uh, debates around uh, le through left east. What seem to be, if you had to highlight a couple of obstacles you know, problematic ideas or assumptions that are kind of holding back this process of breaking through propaganda, breaking through kind of uh, absurd uh, leftist dogma. Uh, what would you want to highlight here? And Jonathan, maybe I'll ask you the same thing before we go to some fresh questions that hopefully can take us into some new terrain from our from our audience. And again, if you if you do have a question, please post it in the chat. You might even repost it so that it's it's easier to see now that we are. If you post it earlier, so make sure we don't miss anyone who wants to speak. Uh, Alina, what would you highlight? What blockages needs to go if we're going to make progress here? Yeah, I think that of course um, in Canada it's it's pretty much the same kind of discourse um, at the level of the state about self-determination. So I'll just, I'll come back to that in a second. But the first point I want to make is I think as I did in the fir first time I was here on this um, um, podcast is, is that um, I think on the kind of old left in, in Canada, in, in the unions um, too, um, it's all it's it, there's a confusion around how you know Russia today still kind of presents this um, I don't know like a Soviet legacy for people. Um, however critical we can be of, of that of the Soviet Union itself, we can bracket that to you know for now. But I think that that must be the first point of attack. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we, we need to really challenge this idea that this is a continuity of the Soviet past. And I think that's really has been one of my conversations like on repeat here in Canada on, on various email, you know, threads and so on. Um, that no, actually, in fact, there's a there's a rupture between uh, the Putin regime and the Soviet era, and especially the the very critical, like early revolutionary politics, right? Um, I mean, he really hates Lenin, you know, um, so that should be enough. But, um, but, um, so I think that's number one. But the second thing, I think we need to on the left, I think we need to go back to this idea of self-determination, of national self-determination. Um, and, and we need to take it back from kind of the liberals stealing, stealing it from us, you know, um, in, in this discourse on Ukraine. And really in, in, in terms of um, an expanded sense of self-determination, I think we need a, 
a critique of the capitalist state in Ukraine as well, um, as, as part of this, right? Um, and its history, both um, the, the history of, of the making of it, you know, and, and how US and the EU have been implicated in that history, right? But also the current opportunity to dispossess Ukrainians during this war, so since 2014, but also now, say, the new labor law reform that's being discussed and implemented right now, um, it's very much, you know, um, opportune, right, right now uh, to, 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 to kind of introduce these very draconian neoliberal austerity measures, right? Um, so that, that's, that's another point. And I think on self-determination in general, I think that you know, the national question must must go back to kind of to the point of view of the actual working class struggle on, on the ground. And here, I think it's important to to kind of if, if Ukrainian resistance today to Russian imperialism is indeed a, a, a historical opportunity to reimagine Ukraine, if there is even a chance say there is, right, let's hope there is uh, to reimagine Ukraine as a progressive political project. And if post war future is really tr to be liber liberatory for the working class people in Ukraine resisting occupation um, and those who are displaced by the war, then I think we really need to shift to the critique of political economy and, and an honest engagement with the you know, capitalist state in Ukraine. And, and what can we do in the West, at, at least in, in, you know, what kind of moves can we do here towards that? I think one of them would be um, you know, you can't asking to, you know, demanding to cancel Ukraine's foreign debt. That would be one one very important leftist internationalist demand, right? Um, and and this is kind of by way of thinking about an expanded sense of self determination in Ukraine, um, uh, very much you know, anti-Western imperialism and so on, right? So that would be one thing. And the second thing, of course, is, is, the, is the green tra transition, you know, and um, kind of, um, you know, moving away from uh, oil, oil and gas industries, right? This would most definitely stall Russia's efforts, like invasion in Ukraine and its aggression. But at the same time, I think it's a very good internationalist um, also demand, right, that would also implicate Canada and, and, and its history of settler colonialism, same as in the United States. Um, and, and, you know, um, and, and it's a very much a broader kind of demand that would bring together all kinds of, you know, um, maybe aspects or factions of the left, I think. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Alina. Uh, I see Dave, David wanted to respond, I think, directly, and then we'll go to Jonathan with that same Thank question. You. What are obstacles to making progress towards the, the left and popular response we need? Yeah, David. Well, no, I wanted to respond directly to that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. One of the demands right now should be in the post-war post era for the international debt of Ukraine to be canceled. If we have an interest in uh, Ukraine being uh, a non-fascist state in the post-war era, we need to remove the conditions which lead to austerity, which become a breeding ground for the far right in the Ukraine. So that needs to be part and parcel of what we're doing. But when we're talking about self-determination as this broad idea, right, we can do that. But we have to be consistent about that. We also have to look at the Russian-speaking folks in Donbass and do they have the right for self-determination? By force of arms since 2014, they would say yes, right? We could have a discussion about that. But then we also have to look at uh, the right for self-determination across the globe. What about the longstanding uh, British involvement in Northern Ireland? What about the Turkish invasion of Rojava in Northern Syria, right? What about all of these fights that have been going on for centuries and are going on today around the world? Why are we not seizing English uh, wealthy people's yachts? Why are we not kicking Turkey out of NATO for their aggression against the Kurds? These are questions that need to be applied across the globe, but not just when it's convenient against uh, the enemy of, of a right-wing Russian state. I mean, we can kick out, we should kick out the United States out of NATO, you know? Let's do that first. Uh, and it's aggression around the world. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a real, I mean, many people, we haven't talked about it much today. I'm glad it's now been mentioned, but, but the double standards, right, in, in the attention to, you know, worthy versus unworthy victims of war, uh, the, the dis differentials in the treatment of refugees, 
um, around, you know, and the racialization of that uh, and the, the difference between the, the, the victims of U.S. allied states like the Yemenis suffering under Saudi, you know, U.S. provided Saudi bombs, right? I mean, of course, this nowadays, this is getting labeled whataboutism, right? Like, oh, you're just changing the focus from the most... But 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 I think I don't know that would maybe be a question for for Jonathan. What do we do with this whataboutism discourse that seems to be like just very powerful, effective at at kind of stigmatizing contextualization and historicization of these conflicts altogether, as if to provide a broader framework is to just make light of Putin's most egregious offense, as opposed to uh, you know spreading the light uh, and the critique more broadly, including Putin's aggression and other forms of aggression. Um, I don't want to pin you in with that, Jonathan, although I know you have a lot to say on that. But what would you say, before we go to Q&A, would be uh, you know, another obstacle to moving forward as a left and, and as a peace movement, or even getting our clarity conceptually so that we can start building that consensus around it? Uh, Jonathan, what would you highlight that hasn't been mentioned? Well, um... yes. One thing that might be a bit controversial is this, uh, these analogies between Putin and Hitler, uh, Russia as fascist, Russia as Nazi, um, militarism. And there was an article about this use of the word fascism in the New York Review of Books by, I think his name is Moyne. He's a guest on Doug Henwood's program at times, uh, you know, things can be militaristic and authoritarian without necessarily being fascistic. I'm not trying to whitewash Russia, their brutal military state, but, you know, I mean, there's this narrative, they're getting worse, and I understand that they're getting worse, but let's remember, uh, speaking of talking too much about the US, let's talk about Chechnya. I mean, if you Google the pictures of how Russia treated Chechnya, what happened after that is Sweden purchased enough goods from Russia to pay for about 8% of their military budget and somewhere between hundreds and thousands of Russian military aircraft with their purchases, particularly focused on oil. And Europe continues to purchase oil because they have not made the green transition, even though they've had over a decade to do it. Um, there is also, of course, the double standard with refugees. So part of the problem we have here is if you compare Putin to Hitler, then you say, well, we shouldn't negotiate with Hitler. And then you have no negotiation. You keep militarism. And frankly, this militarism is helping to empower the, the whatever Nazis or fascists they have in Ukraine uh, or Russia, for that matter, whatever the moral or political equivalent that, that is. The other thing that has to be kept in mind, which relates very much to what aboutism, is part of what we see in Russia today are a series of oligarchs who partially have been created by the United States itself during the Yeltsin era and thereabouts during the Carter administration, as I've written about using uh, US congressional reports and then there are others. So, you know, this idea of treating Russia and US as somewhat autonomous and different entities when they're parallel, they are both engaged in military managerialism where one of the states helped create in some ways the other, um, where one, where they both in some ways provoke each other. At one point, Putin did try to cooperate in the war on terror and tried to make a rapprochement that was rebuffed. That doesn't mean that he's not a militaristic thug, but I mean, all these nuances are left. So if the left thinks that Putin is uh, comparable to Hitler, then they don't have to worry about diplomacy. They can just let this war go on and on and on and see how many people die and whether the US public and its politicians uh, will put up with keeping the thing going, okay? And the word, I mean, the other thing, like, I mean, I don't wanna go on and on about this, but like with Hitler, you had ovens and you had cremation, you had killings of millions of people. That's not what's going on here. And in fact, in Yemen, you have something like on the order of 377,000 people died in that conflict as of the end of last year, according to one UN estimate. In this conflict, we don't have those numbers. Now that's not what about is in. That's like suggesting maybe if you want to look, you know, for a more extreme state, there's other places to look. Also, you the point about uh, comparing these other things is to see what's really at stake here. Uh, this has been portrayed as a moral mission where NATO, by being in NATO, you're in, line, in alignment with states that have done things far worse than Russia has done. That's not to apologize for what Russia has done. That's a matter of counting numbers. Maybe not in the scale of refugees although certain Western interests were behind the, uh, what, the facts through arms exports and other forms of intervention led to the, the previous big 
uh, refugee w uh, wave. So anyway, if you have the wrong conception of Russia, it may prevent you from doing much of anything. Then you can just, uh, you should actually work at a defense firm. And like, that's how you should devote your energies. And then you don't have to think about peace or disarmament and negotiation and diplomacy. You know, if, I mean, for example, with Grumman, this is a company I've studied very well. You know, these people were very, very heroic fi uh, figures during World War II. They were part of the arsenal of democracy and they helped defeat fascism. And then some of these people who I interviewed working at the firm went and they supplied weapons to Vietnam, you know? So, I mean, if you're not really clear about what you're dealing with here, you're, there's no point in having a discussion. That's what I would say. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, so much there. We um, we are at 11 minutes past the hour, and I do wanna start bringing in some of the questions we have from the chat box. Uh, Again, those of our, from our live audience, feel free to post or repost your question if we haven't called on you. The first person that I uh, have flagged for to be our first question, I think you have a couple questions, is Lubna, Lubna Qureshi. If we, if we could uh, unmute Lubna and so we can see Lubna as well as hear you. Lubna, I think you have a couple questions that deal with the Swedish context in particular, perhaps for Jonathan, is that right? Please uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, hi, Jonathan, and hi, everyone. Um, I have two questions. One is, is Swedish membership in NATO inevitable? And number two, um, there have been some longtime Swedish diplomats who were always in favor of Swedish uh, neutrality, but have suddenly turned in favor of Swedish membership in NATO. Um, what do you think is driving these veteran old timers, are they genuinely afraid of Russia? Thank you. Thank you. And I actually want to see if we could take another uh, question just to, so we, before we turn it over to the panel, obviously that one may be predominantly for, for Jonathan. Um, let's see if we could, uh, perhaps Peter Ranis, would you like to voice your question, Peter? Peter, if you could unmute yourself. I'm looking at the East German history. I'm not an East European specialist, but when you look at East parts of, of Germany, you see how easily it was for the ex-communists to become fascist today, anti-immigrant, anti-gay, anti-cultural changes in that society. So I agree with, um, with Elena very much that, that Putinism is, is an imperialism, there's nothing left of the Soviet revolutionary context. And as long as we play that game, uh, we're, we're not looking at reality. Um, I know this is, sounds uh, very chauvinistic, but most of these countries have joined NATO because of fear of Russia. And the same thing is happening with Finland and Sweden. I think Putinism is, is, is a new, uh, plutocratic phenomena that we have to see it for what it is. And, and lastly, uh, the Ukraine is a more porous society. Uh, the chances for the working class to make their point and for the scholars and professors and students to penetrate that state are much, much higher than anything that's going to happen in Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can take one more and then we'll kick it all back to the panel. Um, I see Charles uh, Rackless. Would you like to pose your question? Charles, uh, would you like to voice your question yourself? Sure. Thank you. Uh, my question is, is really about the independence of the working class in the fight against inter-imperialist war. What we have here is a uh, unfolding international conflict between two competing imperialisms. Imperialism is not based on uh, Putinism or the desire of one uh, uh, ruling class ideology or another. It's a specific uh, advance or, or actually decline at the highest level of capitalism. These states don't have a choice whether they're going to be imperialist or not. They're driven to it by their internal economics. And the way that we represent, uh, we respond to it, uh, we can say, oh, we're left or we're working class. 
So the left doesn't necessarily tie itself to the working class. The working class has a historic uh, task, and that is to defeat capitalism and replace it with its own rule. That's the next mode of production. It's called socialism. And we can't get there by voting for Biden, as one of the comrades said he did, or by voting for uh, the arms uh, uh, budget, as many uh, leftists say, we have to fund NATO to fund uh, Zelensky. We have to do it by fighting for working class independence in the United States, where we don't have any kind of workers party. We need to initiate a workers party. We need a new Zimmerwald because the international labor and, work and, and peace movement has, has collapsed in the face of imperialism, either they're Putinites or they're NATOites. And, and, and everyone uh, is cannon fodder left in the middle. So we need a new Zimmer wall, we need a new workers internationally, we need to turn the war, the inter-imperialist war where Ukraine is a proxy into a civil war against the capitalist state. That's the only okay. way we can win self-determination for Ukraine and for the Donbass by turning it into a war for uh, workers' liberation. That will spread the socialist revolution uh, from Ukraine across Europe and across Russia. Okay, thank, thank you, Charles. Um, the, um, so not exactly phrased as a question, but I think Peter and Charles's comments in some sense do raise a question between them. And, and, and I don't want, and of course uh, we have Lubna's question more specifically focused on the case of Sweden, but it seems like Peter and Charles basically laying out two different views, right, from the left as to how one should relate to this conflict is seeing it as, as a proxy war between different modes of imperial estates in which the working class has no stake. And therefore we should be trying to turn uh, the proxy war into imperial war into class war against our respective states wherever we may be against our respective ruling classes and peter's a somewhat different position which might recognize that overall framework but still makes a qualitative distinction between the kind of state and the kind of social democracy uh, that could be possible under the ukrainian state with all its problems versus under a russian imperial state uh, if, if I'm paraphrasing correctly. Uh, obviously, I think all of our speakers can can step into the, that broader uh, framework, but but maybe first go to Jonathan with uh, Lubna's specific questions about Sweden. Why the rush to join NATO? Is it a, a legitimate or what's seen as a legitimate fear of Russia? Or is it good faith? Or is it other actors pushing for this for reasons that don't really have to do with legitimate threat? Uh, or perception of threat. Uh, what's your read on the, the Sweden movement yeah, towards okay. NATO? So um, as I stated before, um, if the trigger for Sweden joining NATO is that Russia's done horrific things in Ukraine, why then did they increase all these investments and help pay for the military industrial complex with its imports after Chechnya, in which about 40,000 uh, people, civilians uh, were killed according to various estimates that I've tried to study. Um, it just doesn't wash. I mean, you see what, I, I mean, sometimes Putin is made out to be uh, a Satan, which maybe he is, and sometimes he's made out to be not as bad as he was. I mean, this thing keeps on changing, which I find very, very bad. I mean, Putin was very, very rotten or Russia or the state during Chechnya. They didn't, they didn't get better. They, they did sort of the same thing. This was analyzed in the New York Times. They showed what Russia did in Chechnya. It was horrific and horrible. So this idea that they kind of get, I mean, you know, they, they use these brutal military means to kind of get what they want. Uh, of course, they don't justify it. It's disgusting. But like, let's keep that in perspective. So what happened this time is that a, a series of political entrepreneurs in the right-wing political parties, in the expertise class, in the media, got found a victim that they thought, to use Noam Chomsky and her, uh, Edward Herman's term, a worthy victim. So now we have some worthy victims. The Chechnyans were reduced because they were, now it will get a little intersectional post-colonial with you. I think because they were Muslims perhaps, or branded as terrorists, they were considered unworthy victims. So this is what I meant earlier as part of the perfect storm. So now you have some white people who are victims, who are from a democracy, then all of a sudden they're a bigger threat. The other thing that's to be kept in mind is Sweden has engaged with NATO in a series of military operations, exercises on the Russian border. 
and has partially provoked Russia. That's always classified by the intelligentsia as defensive. But when Russia does the same, that's always classified as offensive. We have a problem here, which is we have a set of politicians. We have a ruling class, if you like that term. We have a set of experts, think tanks, foundations, a whole series of interests that have politically exploited this conflict to advance an agenda. And the reason why some of the uh, classic social democratic diplomatic types switch sides is because this perfect storm was manipulated and exploited by all these interests so as to undermine the credibility of anybody who went the other way. Because then you're a Putin Kramer or you get royalties from the Russia and, and all the, sorry, Putin Kramer, that means Putin hugger in Swedish. I broke into some Swedish there. So that's kind of what happened. And um, it's, you know, uh, Sweden is based in a consensus culture, but as you erode the basis of the consensus, the consensus is built on a new thing. So they just switch, switch sides. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like what the, you know, the Kurds had to do. They had to actually align themselves with the Turks because they were afraid, more afraid of what would happen if they didn't, if you remember that episode. It's somewhat not exactly identical to that. So that's kind of why things uh, shifted. Um, as for my voting for Biden, that was primarily to defeat Trump. I support uh, and educate uh, people about economic democracy and all sorts of things. And, I don't, I don't believe that we're going to have a big class war to get rid of capitalism if we have a population that barely understands its own history and its own military institutions. So before you launch that revolution and use machine guns and tanks and all the rest of it, I would sincerely play, uh, ask you to have folk high schools, study circles, revamp the media, have a cooperative democratic sector, have trade unions involved in procurement of alternative energy and do a lot of other things before we get to that glorious day of um, armed combat to uh, get rid of capitalism, because we don't have our act together to even vaguely or weakly even approach that moment in my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I think I see David has a, a finger up there. David, go ahead. So get into what some of the folks are asking about or commenting on, like in my opinion, uh, what's going on in Russia with Putin, that's not new or original. Uh, that's not a new ism. They have, uh, like the Ukraine, they're a neoliberal capitalist state. And in Russia, it's governed by a strongman. This is not innovative. This is not a new ideological approach. This is a very old uh, authoritarian way of, of running society. But we also can't just create the straw man and make up that the Ukraine is somehow the opposite of that. Ukraine is not a democratic society. They recently outlawed a dozen or so parties that took a different line, largely left parties, many of them, that take a different line than Zelensky and the far, far right. The far right has a huge influence in that country uh, since the 2014 coup. So this is not a democracy versus authoritarian. These are two capitalist uh, nations waging war. And there was aggressions on both sides prior to the invasion. That does not exonerate Russia for their imperialist invasion. I need to say that again, of the Ukraine. Russia should be condemned, but this is not just black versus white. This is something different from that. Thank you, David. Alina, do you like to respond to that round of questions before we go to our next? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I have much of a response, but um, maybe I could comment on the way in which um, Ukrainians have been, um, the Ukrainian working class as well, has been kind of constructed as white and European. And um, I think we need to be critical of this all of a sudden, like, you know, in Europe, Ukrainians are our own, you know, uh, meanwhile, others are barred from entry, you know, are killed on the border in Belarus and, and, and in, in uh, Poland, um, using high tech sort of uh, border patrol and so on, right? So I think here, this is important uh, to navigate that um, there's going to be quite a lot of, I think also um, kind of, uh, the false expectations and 
uh, I think Ukrainian refugees uh, who will travel to the EU, and I think this is happening already, will be quite disappointed with what that gives them, you know, as a, fu as a future <laughs> uh, life. So um, in a material sense. So I think that, um, again, we need to go back to thinking about an alternative in Ukraine that is much more redistributive, pluralistic, and so on, and critical of this Europeanness um, definition of the Ukrainian nation or um, Ukrainian, you know, self determination on European terms. Thank you, Alina. We have a couple more questions. I don't know if we have people to voice them, or I may have to read them um, from the chat box. I, I will make one call out, though. Uh, Peace, Gaya, are you there to be able to uh, speak? your own question. I know you had a question in the chat box. I wanted to give you a chance before I relay it, but won't wait too long. Okay, um, so first off, we're gonna to go to a different question actually here. Uh, this is from Kate, uh, who asks uh, that her question be read out. This may be from Facebook or fr from on, well, actually, no, I think this is from, from a live participant as well. Uh, Kate writes, I wonder if in conversations about the possibility of solidarity without militarism, we could learn from cases where such solidarity did not happen. For example, in Belarus in 2020, when Belarusian workers uh, called for solidarity from European workers and appealed to EU organizations, there was no reply. One country's workers said they had to honor prior contracts, for example, and when one European company thought of pulling out of Belarus, its own locally uh, located domestically workers voted against it because it was their most profitable branch. How do our ideas of solidarity look like um, if we admit that these days welfare of workers in some countries is connected to or depends on the oppression of workers in others? What kind of education, organizing and unions and activist spaces could be done to foster international workers solidarity? Uh, that's a very, very big question. Um, certainly would love to hear David's thoughts on it uh, and others. I mean, we are getting close to the 90 minute mark. And so I, I do think uh, we should be thinking about closing comments. Maybe we can do one more round of questions and then some closing comments. But uh, David, do you want to take a, take a look at that one? Or and I mean, Olina as well. I don't know if, if, if you and uh, Left East have been attentive to this dimension, the, the struggle to build working class unity before and after this war. Uh, in, in terms of Europe, East East and West. Um, David, do you want to take a shot at that um, broader question? And then maybe Alina, you can step in as well. Sure. So look, all uprisings, all uh, social discontent are not created equal. When we look at uh, the fall of the Soviet bloc uh, at, towards the end of uh, what I would call the first round of the Cold War, uh, what came out of that was a disaster. For decades, uh, the living standards and the uh, infant mortality rates uh, went up as they capitalized Eastern Europe. That's not meant as a defense of the authoritarian communism that was uh, that side of the Iron Curtain at that time, but it's just a statement of reality. So international uprisings are not all created equal. But what labor needs to do, it's an imperative, is where workers are rising up in a progressive fashion to change society for the better, not for the interests of the capitalists, but for the interests of actual working people, we need to open those doors. We need to put out our hands in solidarity to support them. The Vermont AFL-CIO uh, was the first major US labor organization in the world, uh, I'm sorry, in the United States to recognize the Kurdish government in Rojava. And we've offered the concrete solidarity of um, taking in any returning uh, American fighters who went to fight with the YPG and the YPJ for the liberation of that region and to support them and set them up with union jobs. We had one returning fighter that we did um, sponsor who we provided three months of room and board for uh, and got them a job installing uh, solar panels with the IBEW. And that's a concrete thing, right? In larger ways, that's what we need to be doing across the globe. Uh, we need to be shutting down ports to support international struggles where it's appropriate. There is so much more we should be doing, but labor cannot be just looking at uh, the economic interests of the capitalist class when it's deciding where to take a stand or where to fight. Thank you, David. Alina, could you speak yeah. a little more to this question of the, the, the working class fragmentation across 
across Europe, perhaps? Yes. Yeah, I, I would like to, um, I really like this question. I'll read it out again. How do, how do our ideas of solidarity look like if we admit that these days welfare of workers in some countries is connected to or depends on the oppression of workers and others? We know that the welfare states in Canada, in the United States and, and in the Nordic countries also, but here especially, were built on the exclusion of some workers, both in, inside here in, in Canada and the United States, but also uh, based on cheap labor, on, on domestic workers' labor, right? Um, and cheap resources um, um, from, from the global south, from the third world at the time, right? So I think this isn't a new situation at all. In fact, this is how global capitalism has worked. Um, and I think Marx's dependency theory should be revived in this in this regard, you know. Um, anyway, I think that European workers um, welfare has been built on the Ukrainian workers exploitation, both inside Ukraine and in Europe as migrant workers, as cheap migrant laborers in Europe, especially um, since 2014, but since the 90s and the fall of the Soviet Union. And this this has been, um, you know, kind of precarious labor, but especially, you know, domestic uh, work and child care and, uh, you know, farm work and so on, very much gendered labor. Um, and yeah, so of course, um, you know, the, the case of the war in Ukraine and all of a sudden this kind of um, idea that Ukrainians are European is, is an interesting one because, it, you know, uh, we remember this history and Ukrainians who left before and how they've been welcomed in Europe, right? So we need to remember this. Um, now, uh, with, with Ukrainian refugees going to Europe and say needing housing and needing childcare um, and access to food and so on, I think um, a lot of especially feminist and, and, and even anarchist movements in uh, Western and Southern Europe um, are, are bringing these demands to the state and saying, actually, no, these, these demands for socialized housing, for accessible childcare, free transportation are, are all of our demands. And, and um, the, the refugees from Ukraine and us are kind of in the same boat here, you know, because, because um, these, dem these demands also, um, in fact, put a mirror to the EU's you know, face in a sense, um, showing how much workers in, in the EU have also been expropriated of social, of housing, say, or uh, good wages and protection, you know, um, at work and so on, right? Um, so I think this is very important and, and the gradations of that expropriation, say, in the EU versus, you know, Poland versus now Ukraine. Thank you, Alina. Cognizant of the time, I believe our speaker is all committed to 90 minutes today. I mean, sometimes we, we do run to two hours occasionally on, on this show, but I, in, in the spirit of keeping this show tight, uh, unless there is a pressing question from an audience member, I wanted to welcome our guests maybe into a closing comment. And I'll just offer a couple of questions and you could maybe pick one of them to go with. I mean, one would be, and this may be building a little bit on what Elena and David have just pointed to, but what would be forms of solidarity that are manifesting or that could be manifest and organized and amplified that would that would transcend um, or break with kind of predominant militarist or imperialist narratives of so-called solidarity that are predominant, at least in the United States context right now? What would be an alternative mode or example of solidarity that you can point to or that you're participating in that you want to highlight as we, we close the show? Uh, that would be the positive, I guess, constructive element. I would also, though, want to sharpen up a question. And here is one that I think Peace Agea was going to ask. So I'll just I'll I'll I'll, I'll kind of move it into the uh, to this final spiel by me as well. Uh, and that is, who is benefiting from this war? I mean, it, it's clear that an escalation of this war can be bad for many many parties, including Ukrainians themselves, in the sense of you know the United States pushing them to fight to the last Ukrainian without changing the eventual diplomatic results of this war altogether. Uh, but who stands to gain and, and you know uh, from this materially? And, and how can we spotlight the, some of those insidious interests more concretely to open up uh, methods of struggle and, and, and organizing here in the, in the belly of the beast um, and not you know in, in a way that might bring out the underlying class interest that fuels so much of this mil military imperial 
response. So again, uh, one one question more critical, one more, uh, if not utopian, then constructive. Uh, uh, who's benefiting from this militarist approach that hasn't maybe been mentioned yet? And, and what's an alternative that you see uh, actually existing or that potentially we could work together to, to build? Uh, maybe we can go, go with Jonathan since Elena just spoke. Jonathan, David, and then let Elena wrap up. Jonathan? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I'm going to try to combine the answers. I think the, the military, industrial, or warfare states of the U.S. and uh, Russia have uh, in some ways benefited, even though in Russia they're losing out. But uh, that kind of approach to affairs and the oil industry in some ways has benefited. Um, I think we have to put against this some kind of green industrial complex or some kind of alignment of green forces built on the following. First, the Russian peace movement. Second, the delinking from oil, whether it's Russian or Canadian or US. And then uh, third, some kind of proactive procurement and economic strategy that links alternative energy, mass transit, cooperatives, green manufacturing in unionized jobs. So I think those are the moves that I would make we have, we have concentrated interests. And then I would throw in something related to media accountability and being able to change the discourse uh, built on things like folk high schools and study circles. We have a lot of work to do. If we don't have these components, I do believe we will not be very successful. And I think that these, there's a way we have to take, uh, this also relates to the questions that were, the comments made by Elena about uh, integration. You know, we need to use cooperatives procurement to build up the integration of people, whether they're in Ukraine or they're refugees or migrants or industrial workers. So we have to do those things in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate you outlining that potential program here. David, what would you leave us with? Look. The absolute best solidarity that we can provide in the United States, at least, to uh, the folks in Ukraine or around the world is building a, a truly uh, much further left working class movement in this country to change the nature of our society and our economy. Because who's benefiting from the war in the Ukraine? It's the weapons manufacturers. It's big oil. It's the capitalist class. And until we could take them down domestically in our own country, and until we could build a society that puts the needs of people before that of the, uh, the interests of the corporations, until we can do that, they're gonna continue, uh, the big capitalists, to drive foreign policy uh, in the US and therefore impact around the world. So we need to build a radical militant left labor movement. We need to change the way that the AFL-CIO engages in politics. We need to change the way uh, that we approach politics in general in the United States, and we need to win, and we need to do that now. Amen. Thank you, David. Olina, last yeah. but not least. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think I would repeat um, the two points I've already, I, I've already mentioned. It's um, kind of demanding cancellation of Ukraine's foreign debt. I think it's a very practical demand, and you know, very much materialist like uh, demand um, that would go a long way, um, making that a priority for unions engaging with this war in, in Ukraine and you know solidarity with working class people in Ukraine and in Russia. So that's number one. Number two, um, I think the kind of green transition, but I would argue further, um, instead of a green new deal, you know, as it is called in the US, but um, um, and a play on kind of the welfare, the post-war Keynesian welfare state um, new deal um, economy, but instead of a green new deal, I would say a red deal, right? Which, which re kind of re-envisions our relationship re-envisions the relationship between how we produce and consume, changing that. So, um, so uh, much more um, about the redistribution and, uh, and, and, and re-evaluation of how we, we um, produce, um, but also kind of from, this, uh, from the lens of social reproduction and life-making. I think this is 
the second demand that I would put on the table if I could. Um, and, and the third thing would be, um, I, I think, equal treatment of, of all refugees, of all wars. Um, also very practical demand um, in the EU and also for Canada and the United States, that not just Ukrainians, but also Syrians and Yemeni people and people from Afghanistan, um, at, both the equal treatment of refugees, but at the same time, humanitarian aid, which has been taken away from some of these other countries, some of these other regions, and towards Ukraine and focused only on Ukraine. But no, in fact, we have to we have to focus on those on those places as well and and value those lives as well. That that would be my closing remark. Thank you, Olina. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, David for a very rich conversation today. I think we're gonna wrap up here on Shelter and Solidarity, our Ukraine show number two. I believe that we should have a third one. Uh, there are many important issues that have been surfaced today and including the, the political program looking forward on how to empower working class movement in the United States and globally and how to develop the mechanisms and the power to actually make solidarity count and not have the only hegemonic form of solidarity in, in mainstream discourse be a militarized one that's so deeply embedded with these militarist corporations and, and, and imperialist capitalist interests. I just want to thank you all and thank the whole audience for being here today and everybody on Facebook and here on Zoom. We will have two more shows in June with Shelter and Solidarity in, in just about a week on Thursday, June 9th. We will have the poets of Flower Song from the West Coast, Matt Cedillo, Brianna Munoz and others from the Flower Song Press, Chicano, Chicanx uh, poets, progressive radical poets doing a little arts and resistance show. And then we'll be returning to the theme of debt, specifically the, the topic of student debt abolition on June 25th, that's Saturday at one o'clock. We will have Astra Taylor, Jason Wozniak of the Debt uh, Collective, as well as debt scholar activist, Jeffrey Jay Williams on the show to talk about building and amplifying calls for the abolition of student debt and other kinds of financial debt and the ideological uh, constraints that, that that debt puts on people's lives. We hope you can join us for some of those shows. Please check us out. Our archive of shows, including this one within a few days, will be up at shelterandsolidarity.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Shelter and Solidarity on YouTube. You can see our over 70 episodes that we have uh, we have recorded over the last couple of years now in year three. And I'll just uh, conclude by thanking the co-producers of this show with whom this would not be possible. Lena Durkin, congrats to Le Lena also for just graduating from UMass Boston and claiming her bachelor's degree. Lena, we're proud of you and thank you for being so supportive of this project, even while going through your finals period. Also, Linda Liu, Kira Mudliar, Seren Mudliar, Mark Soderstrom, Tim Sheard, Rachel Yerishas Patton, uh, and others. Um, we have co sponsors that we need to thank the Community Church of Boston, a free community for the study and practice of universal religion, Encuentro Cinco, affectionately known as E5, a movement building project in downtown Boston, Hardball Press, a leading publisher of labor and social justice stories for adults and children. You can find them at hardballpress.com. If you have any birthdays coming up for little ones, in your life, think about Hardball Press, the Liberty Tree Foundation, an organization serving the democracy movement and the democratic revolution. And last but not least, Socialism and Democracy, a journal that brings together the worlds of scholarship and activism, theory and practice to examine in depth the core issues and popular movements of our time. That's sdonline.org, Socialism and Democracy. Thank you, everyone, and uh, for being here today. And we'll hopefully see you next time. Solidarity to you wherever you are. If you're fighting the good fight. Have a good day.